Hello, it's 10 years since British troops left Helmand in southern Afghanistan. So, this time on SITREP, we examine how Operation Herrick still shapes the UK's armed forces today. In terms of what Afghanistan means today, in my view, is we must never lose sight of the importance of war fighting and what it takes. And what's going on in Ukraine is a reminder of that. And I think there is a danger we are losing sight of that, both in terms of a moral and a material component. We'll hear more from Colonel Stuart Tootle, who led the UK's first combat team into Helmand, and talk to Lieutenant General Richard Nugy, who was there in the very final days. And how has Operation Herrick shaped the men and women who served? I went to Afghanistan at 24. I came back at the same age, but I felt... 10 years older. I think my time up here has absolutely moulded me as a person. You know, I genuinely believe you cannot understand true love until you've seen true loss. Sit Rev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Officially, Operation Herrick ended in December 2014, but the real moment of significance came in the October, when British troops left Helmand, where they had fought for more than eight years and where Camp Bastion had been their home. Mr Speaker, yesterday British forces concluded their combat mission in Afghanistan. The Union flag, the Stars and Stripes and the flag of NATO are lowered, leaving that of Afghanistan flying alone. The final lift came with just eight helicopters taking the very last 156 troops out. It's been a very, very big operation. We've moved uh, four and a half, five thousand pieces of equipment, mostly by air. This has been a, a spectacularly large but very successful logistic operation. The significance of this moment could not have been lost on these troops as they took their last steps on Helmand soil. It marked the end of an eight-year campaign in Helmand province and 13 years of British combat operations in Afghanistan. Mike, uh, 10 years ago, it, it doesn't seem anything like that long, does it? No, it still feels like a contemporary uh, politics to most of us. And, you know, that, that final withdrawal, some of us at the time worried that it might be a terrible mess if the Taliban attacked while the withdrawal was underway, because withdrawing is one of the hardest things that the military can do if they're having to withdraw in contact. And actually, it went incredibly well. So the whole thing was done as tidily uh, as it had been done when the... the Brits got involved uh, originally after the uh, 9-11 attacks of 2001. But it was a long campaign, a very long campaign, and it shaped the forces, it shaped the army, and it shaped the way we, the public, thought about the army and the forces. Long time. Mm -hmm. We've reflected many times on the work of British troops in Afghanistan, their successes and their losses, and what has happened since they left. But today, a decade on, we want to assess how all that shapes our armed forces in 2024 and whether that shape is right for what they have to do now and maybe next. And here to help us with that, one of the voices you heard a moment ago, Lieutenant General Richard Nugy. Uh, great to see you, Richard. Um, you were there for the final drawdown. Yes, I was uh, uh, actually based in Kabul, but um, effectively it was our plan that uh, withdrew all the NATO troops out of Afghanistan. So 70,000 troops and some million pieces of equipment and materiel to get out. Um, and all done um, very specifically um, with, with, if you like, uh, safety in mind, uh, trying to make sure that we lost no lives um, in the withdrawal, as, as, as Michael has, has sort of intimated and um, making sure that the Taliban didn't win a propaganda campaign, that they were fighting extremely hard, where they wanted to turn around and say, we have kicked you out. And our mm. line very firmly was, no, this is our choice. We believe the Afghans are strong enough to support themselves, and therefore our time is over. We were successful, um, almost completely successful, in very little loss of life across the 70,000 troops as we withdrew. Uh, which I count as a great success. There, there were a couple of incidents, but but they were very few. And I think we did win the propaganda war, if you like, with the Taliban. We left on our own terms and we were not seen in 2014 uh, to be being chased out. And, and I think that was incredibly important for NATO and for the British Armed Forces. And Richard, is it fair to say Afghanistan and Iraq at the same time, two huge counterinsurgency fights radically affected the shape of the army and its fighting power? Yes, I think um, 
Uh, I mean, I've been brought up uh, listening to Michael all my career, and um, you know, there's, there, there's a piece about um, fighting a war or the war, and we had to fight the war in front of us, not the war that we might be fighting in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. We had to fight the war in front of us. I, I often ca- characterise that the British Army was at war. The other two services less so, to be honest, but the British Army was at war. And what did that mean to us? Um, the way I characterised that, it's not like the First and Second World Wars, which was perpetual, but the day you came home from Op Herrick, um, you knew the date that you were going back. So you were never off the hook of the uh, tempo and the time you had between operations was largely spent training and a little bit of leave. So we were at war. So we had to change the whole of the army to fight the war in front of us. We changed our equipment. We changed our mindset. We changed our training. We changed just about everything to win the war in front of us because that was what was important. And of course, that was a particular type of campaign. And inevitably, therefore, the sort of campaign that we're seeing in Ukraine, uh, Stuart mentioned, for example, was not at the top of our agenda, because whilst we absolutely need to understand that and how to fight that, we needed to win the war in front of us. So, Mike, um, the other two services, the RAF and especially the Royal Navy, it's tempting to think they were less affected. Uh, well, they were affected. Yeah, I mean, the RAF uh, was running operations all the time, and the Navy deployed quite a lot of personnel to Afghanistan over the years. You look at the number of Navy people who served in um, ground support and combat roles, it's quite interesting. And I remember Alan West, who was first Sea Lord, was making the point very forcibly in Parliament. He said, don't think the Navy is not doing quite a lot in Afghanistan. It's actually doing a great deal in terms of boots on the ground. But yes, the point is the other two services were recapitalizing during this time. You know, the Navy was, was thinking about about the new ships it would need for the 2020s and the Air Force, about its new aircraft types, the new fast jets and transport. And the army was being bent out of shape um, because, as Richard mm-hmm. said, it was fighting the war in front of it. And so the army had had this war to concentrate on. And because we don't have a bigger army, it, ne- it needed the whole of the army to concentrate on this war, not just a part of the army to do this war while the rest of the army did something else. I mean, that, w- that would have been the case in the 1930s, but not now. And so the army was bent out of shape or into a particular shape for Afghanistan, where the other two services were getting on with their own rethinking of their post-Cold War role. Mm. So, Richard, let's go through how much of that reshaping is still there. If we look at the Army's equipment, they've got a fleet of protected patrol vehicles from Foxhound to Ridgeback, all procured for the desert fighting. How much use could they be in the future? Well, I think some of it is absolutely of use. Um, War is a terrible thing and and something to be avoided if you can possibly do so. And I sort of put that down first of all. But armies learn from warfare. They learn from doing as opposed to practising. And so we have learned how to use those sorts of vehicles in the most effective way, both for the sort of campaign we were doing in Afghanistan, but we have learned how we can use them uh, in different types of um, operations. But it's more that the uh, prioritization of equipment went to mobility um, and protected mobility for infantry. We didn't use tanks out there. So our tank schedule, if you like, and our tank training diminished. We didn't use artillery very much out there. We did use some, but nothing like the sort of massed artillery that you're seeing by the Russians and the Ukrainians um, on that front at the moment. And we we sort of lost the capability to do so. More importantly, we lost the equipment. And, and you know, we're slowly recapitalizing that now, but it's taken time to uh, try and do that. So it's about prioritization. We prioritise those equipments that would be really good for Afghanistan. We can use some of them, without a doubt. But with that that skewing of of the equipment for for the type of fighting we're doing in Afghanistan, what is having to be built up now? So, um, I mean, it's it's all over the papers. Air defence was almost non-existent. Well, it was non-existent in Afghanistan. We now need to understand air defence both for drones and fighter jets again. Our, our legacy equipment has had 10 years of not even being thought about, really, because we didn't need to in Afghanistan. Our tanks, we've got Challenger 3 coming on board, uh, but that's all been slightly later than we would have had if we'd actually been practising with them all the time, I would suggest. And we need to think about how the modern ideas of warfare of drones and things like that affect our ability to operate and what we need in terms of counter um, cyber and so on uh, because that's the way warfare is going we haven't done that for 10 years we've been out of the loop for 10 years because we've been fighting in afghanistan 
Yeah, you know, there's a funny um, historical parallel to all of this in the 1930s and so on, because after the First World War, the British Army was a, was a heavy war-fighting army. It knew The Western Front Army knew what it was doing, and it was a very skillful army by 1918. And then it spent the 20s and 30s on colonial operations on the northwest frontier in places like Afghanistan, in the Middle East, in Iraq, and so on. And then suddenly, it, it, and, and people used to talk about, you know, this is not the Western Front anymore, you know, this is light infantry, this is, this is what we do now. Now. And then suddenly in 1939, the whole army had to switch back again to the, to the European role and get back to war fighting. And it's almost as if we're repeating a degree of that sort of transition where you see an army goes from a sort mm -hmm. of Western Front European army fighting a war to something much more like colonial policing and then all the way back again. Here we are again. So, so in terms of the personnel, Richard, we know the forces are a lot smaller than a decade ago. But what about, about the balance and the types of people? Did Afghanistan change that? I think the structure of the army itself was less affected, funnily enough. Um, uh, my, Michael might have a different view, but, but I think the structure itself was less affected, but the use to which we put people was definitely affected. Let's take engineers, for example. The traditional roles of engineers, and there's lots and lots of traditional roles of engineers, were sort of skewed into um, IED hunting and uh, one or two other things like that, rather than the very expansive roles that the Royal Engineers, the, the crossing of, of, of rivers, the uh, bridges and things like that, which just wasn't needed. Um, so we took people whose skills um, were needed for that and put them into different operations. So they still remained Royal Engineers, they still remained in the regiments, but if you like, we used them very, very differently. And you, and you have that also with a lot of people became infantry who wouldn't normally have done infantry. Now we've done that before in Northern Ireland. I spent four tours in Northern Ireland um, and um, was an infantryman in Northern Ireland, but actually uh, my cat badge wasn't infantry. So we've done it before, but in the past, we've had the ability to, as Michael said, had part of the army doing its core skills and part mm -hmm. of the army doing counterinsurgency. This time we didn't. Everybody got slewed towards infantry and protection. That's really interesting um, when you say that people are being, were using slightly different roles and pulling on their expertise. Mike, do you think that's had a lasting effect? Oh, yes. Um, you, and when you speak to anybody now and you're talking about their careers, very often now they're in civilian life, and they always say, oh, yeah, I did this and this, and then I did two Afghans. That's the way they put it. Oh, I, did, I did an Afghan or I did three Afghans, meaning tours. And everybody did Everybody did a bit of Afghanistan. Um, everybody in this present generation that you speak to did a bit of Afghanistan. And so that's been a common experience. It's been, and there's some great value in that, of course. But it does show how much the army had to give itself to to, as, as Richard said, the war it was fighting. It couldn't, we, could, we couldn't fight two wars at once, even though we had you know, troops in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But essentially, we were addressing the one war that we could deal with, or the army could deal with, at any one time. Rich, what about the, the mindset? Because, for example, we see a big difference in the expected levels of protection for troops at the start of, the Afghanistan, of Af Afghanistan to what it was at the end. I mean, I, I remember very clearly, I was uh, first uh, deployed to Afghanistan in 2006-07 with the Ace Rapid Reaction Corps, the ARC, under uh, General David Richards. And we were really heavily into counterinsurgency. And when we came back, he, he turned around and said, right, we're going to do a war fighting exercise. We're going to do a force on force exercise to really try and, re and this was 2007, really try and understand how we fight a proper war. And one of the, I was um, responsible, among other things, for targeting. And one of the questions that came up is how many uh, casualties are acceptable, the civilian casualties? And in, in a counterinsurgency, the answer is zero, um, uh, is acceptable. In a war on war, as we're seeing in, in Ukraine, as we're seeing in Gaza, as we're seeing in, in the Lebanon, the civilian casualties are a fact in a force on force war. However much you try and avoid them, they're a fact. And therefore, we were trying desperately to get back into a mindset of what is acceptable in a force on force war, which we didn't have as a, as a problem because the answer was zero um, in, in a counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have to rethink so much about how you go about things, um, things that are affordable, if you like, in a, a counterinsurgency, you can spend ages trying to find one person. Um, in a force-on-force in a force war, that's just not a probability and it's not a possibility. 
however unfortunate that is. And so it is a completely different mindset. And it's, in a sense, you've got to be much, much, much harder in a force-on-force war. And Mike, we've heard it many times on the programme before. The trick is to be ready for the next war, not the last one. How different will the next war be? Well, if the next war is something to do with European security, it will be very different. Um, and it looks increasingly as if it is. And so we've got to prepare ourselves for something uh, not, not traditional. I mean, traditional in the, in the objectives, that is maintaining European security against naked aggression. That's what it looks as if we are, are up against. But the next war will be different because the technologies are so different, the battlefield is so different, it will be more terrible in lots of ways and we're still grasping the conceptual differences of uh, force on force war now and um, I'm doing a certain amount of work on this and to be honest Kate it is scary stuff it's really scary. Mm, mm. Richard what, what does need to change to be ready for the next war? Well I think armies are always accused of looking backwards um, not looking forwards and um, always uh, accused of fighting the last war. Well, that's partly because uh, the, the next war will evolve and innovate in ways that we can't predict to a very large extent. And, and um, we've got to learn the correct lessons from Afghanistan and Iraq. And there are lessons to be learned that are still valid on force on force war. I mean, one of them, for example, is we relearned really, really quickly about casualties taking somebody off a battlefield on a battlefield stretcher in full kit with body armor and helmet and rifle is blooming difficult. It's heavy and it takes time. And we had forgotten that because we'd simulated it for so long. So those are the sorts, and and therefore you need to be of a certain fitness uh, in order to be able to do that. That's still relevant in a force on force war. We're not going to be able to get helicopters there within 20 minutes on a force on force war. So we've got to relearn all our first aid to make sure that we can get them back to the first aid post and then get back. Funny enough, I'm speaking next week to a um, Ukrainian doctor. It's taking three days for the casualties to get to Kyiv um, to be um, repaired in the hospitals there. Um, they get on a first aid, first aid sort of uh, post um, uh, close to the front line, but it takes three days to get to hospital. We had people in Helmand in hospital within an hour. We've got to relearn all of that. We've got to learn what that means to clog up the whole system with casualties. We've got to learn how to operate in a different environment with drones, with cyber attack all the time. I was uh, talking to an artilleryman just recently. He said, there's no point in using GPS guided uh, uh, munitions at the moment because the Russians have cyber protection, which means that those GPS missions always, uh, uh, munitions always miss. You know, we've got to go back to dumb bombs, if you like. These sorts of things, we've got to learn so much from Ukraine, uh, from Russia, uh, from the Israelis, who are fighting a very, very different type of war again, and start to build. But you go back to that mindset. It's about having a strength of character to be able to persevere, which we were really good at in Helmand. That's what we learned. Our youngsters today are as good as they've ever been put into those contexts. We've got to reinforce that um, when actually it'll be really difficult in a force of force war. So good to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much, Lieutenant General Richard Nugy. Great to have you on SITREP. Thank you. Well, of course, 13 years of combat operations in Afghanistan didn't just impact the armed forces themselves. They were also formative for the people who served on those operations. So we asked some from Op Herrick for their memories and their reflections on how it shaped who they are today. I'm Patrick Hennessy. Um, I served on Op Herrick 6 principally in 2007. Um, but then I was also out uh, in Afghanistan in 2000. 9, 2010, and then as a civilian uh, in 2013, just before the uh, the handover. I think uh, Afghanistan was, um, for, for everybody who was, who was out there, a pretty formative experience. I mean, like the, the tour that we did in 2007 was um, surprising and fulfilling to me. I mean, it was very raw. Um, the combat side of it was very arduous, um, but it was also quite free-flowing. Um, it was quite but in some respects, if you were if you were a junior and you were lucky enough to, to come out unscathed, it was one of those conflicts that kind of printed itself on on the the collective psyche, particularly of the, of the army. And when I was at Sandhurst, the sort of formative combat experience, I think, was probably still the Falklands. I suspect what's happened now is that there are generations of, of students at Sandhurst and Catterick who are sort of probably bored of hearing about how this attack went down in Sangin in the same way that we were. <laughs> 
a bit bored of hearing about Goose Greed, but it, it just shows how lessons repeat themselves. My name's Liz McConaughey, also known as Chinook Kruchik, and I was a Chinook crewman for the whole of that campaign. So I ended up, by the time Alperic had finished, I'd done 10 deployments on Alperic, working on the battlefield helicopter that is the mighty Waka Waka. So whenever I first deployed on Alperic, uh, we were based in Kandahar and Camp Bastion didn't even exist. And part of the Chinook Force's day-to-day -day tasking was to help build Camp Bastion up out of the ground. It was just a barbed wire fence surrounding a big dust bowl. And I think to look at what we had created by the end of Alperic after all that time out there, you know, it was like a small city. It was the size of Reading. My my name is Sean Bell. I'm a former fighter pilot, a Harrier pilot in the Royal Air Force. Um, I did three tours in Afghanistan, um, one as a pilot down at Kandahar Airfield, one running the Expeditionary Air Wing down there, and then the longest, a one-year tour up with uh, the ISAF headquarters up in Kabul. But when you were flying, um, the first thing that the uh, Army colleagues would ask for was a show of force, and that often meant just flying as low and as fast as you dared. Um, because the Taliban didn't really have a lot of uh, um, weapons that could affect the Harrier. They had some very simple surface-to-air missiles, but there were some fairly rudimentary ways you could avoid that. But as soon as they heard the noise, as soon as they heard the jet thundering overhead, it had the desired effect, and they fled. In many ways, I think most pilots feel not very vulnerable when they're in the cockpit. You felt a lot more vulnerable when you're actually on the ground um, because you're no longer master of your destiny. And I think many of us, um, you know, our day-to-day -day life at Kandahar, which used to come under regular attack, some of our aircraft were struck at times and the like, that's where you felt a little bit more philosophical because you just weren't sure when you're going to struck. I'm Sally Orange and I served on Op Herrick 13 back in 2011 and I was the OC of the Deployed Medical Rehabilitation Team which was based primarily in Cambastion. I feel incredibly privileged and proud to have served on, on Op Herrick and I think the skills that I've learnt um, have certainly helped me through, through life, um, you know, Sometimes if I'm having a difficult time, I just think back to some of those patients who sadly didn't make it or have had very life changing injuries. And yeah, they can become my determination in, you know, when if I'm struggling with things of thinking, well, you know, you haven't had to go through that or so. So I try and use it in a, in a positive way to, to be able to show that. My name's uh, Stuart Tootle. I was a colonel in the Parachute Regiment Commanding 3 Para, and we were the first battalion and, in fact, battle group that went into Helmand Province in 2006. There are a legion of memories. Um, high points, flying into battle, abortion of helicopters, air assaulting into the Sangin Valley, you know, high-octane stuff. That's what soldiers, you know, born to do, especially paratroopers. Um, seeing... The enormous sort of gallantry and self-sacrifice, uh, which was often heart-rendering. We won a Victoria Cross, a George Cross, nine MCs and a host of other medals and decorations. Um, and even if you didn't get a medal, it didn't mean that you weren't doing a fantastic job. And, and, you know, that's what people did. And that was all warming as a commanding officer and being side by side with your soldiers. But then of course, you know, there are other moments, there are low points. I zipped far too many people into body bags. Um, I had to have far too many conversations with family members. I think my time in Alperic has absolutely moulded me as a person. You know, I genuinely believe you cannot understand true love until you've seen true loss. And I think certainly for me, coming back to Mert, we we witnessed a lot of loss down the back of our aircraft. And I think, you know, that just the, the gravity of those emotions have certainly stayed with me uh, to this day and, and certainly shaped how I, I feel about the value of life and how I appreciate it so much more. We got involved in supporting a couple of orphanages in um, Kabul. Desperate needed to raise money for them. Three months later, we hadn't raised $1,000. We'd raised $100,000. And I went back after I'd left the military some years later to one of these orphanages. And where before they'd been despair, kids that half the size they should have been, no health care, no proper food, no sanitation. Now it was all being run properly. There were kids with haircuts, books under their arms, and people in the city trying to get their kids into the orphanage because they knew they had a future. And it was really heartwarming. And I know that's got nothing to do with our military action, but that was the strongest memory I took away from, from our time out there. It probably 
gives me a touchstone of faith that whatever I do and have done in the rest of my life, it was the most rewarding thing that I ever did. And don't get me wrong, you know, I had a good life and I was very lucky to come back from Afghanistan untouched in a way that many were not. But still, it is the most remarkable, commendable thing, I think, that I've ever done. And that's because of the people I was with. I think I matured a lot from the experience of, um, you know, possibly that was the experience of being in the army generally, but definitely um, that first tour in 2007, you know, I went to Afghanistan at 24 and I came back at the same age, but I felt 10 years older. And I think that's uh, something that a lot of people who've been in kind of prolonged, um, intense combat experience. Um, but also I think it makes you optimistic. I, I still have to this day, uh, I, I hope, a sense of perspective. Um, you know, I have a job these days which is stressful at times and boring at times, but um, the worst day I have at the office is never going to be as intense as the most intense day I had in Afghanistan. Uh, Mike, what you get from that is that the war really does change people, doesn't it? Yes, it does. You know, I always say that um, real warfare like that uh, some people give up their lives and some people give up normality for the rest of their lives in injuries. But everybody, everybody gives up a little bit of their sanity. It costs everybody a little bit, but it gives as well. Um, that comment by Sean Bell, he said, you know, putting 100,000 into a local orphanage, he said that has nothing to do with what we were there for. But actually, Sean, it has everything to do with what you were there for. And that's what happens, That particularly when the British military deploy they they do lots of other things. They try to make a difference. I you know going in and out of Afghanistan as I did entirely as a civilian, I never once mm -hmm. talked to people in the British military who didn't think they were making a difference, who weren't doing their best, not just to do their military job, but to do other things as well that would just be common sense goodness, and it does reinforce your faith in in human nature. When somebody said in that that you don't feel you don't know true love until you've seen it on an operation. I know exactly what she means, exactly what she means. And if we just uh, pick up on a point made by Patrick Hennessy at the start of that, he was taught a lot from the Falklands at Sandhurst and admits of being quite dismissive of it at the time. Is Afghanistan central to what new recruits are taught about military operations today? Well, it's changing. Interestingly, I mean, you know, 2014, we pulled out of Afghanistan. That's exactly when the European scene began to get darker. That was Putin's invasion of Crimea. And since 2014, we know what's happened then, that Europe has, has slipped away from peace and security into what we've got now. And the effect of that on the forces is that before 2014, we were training for operations. The forces were involved in operations and they did their operations as well as they possibly could in the circumstances. But since 2014, the, the, the emphasis now is not training for operations, we've got to train for war. And training for war and being prepared for war is a bit different from doing operations where you can do two or three things simultaneously and you make you make doing men as best you can and you improvise now we have a much more serious challenge and so what the military are now trying to do and this has really affected the army more than the the navy and the air force is switch around to go from being like the old indian army which was a post-colonial army an army that was good at light infantry good at enforcement good at small operations based on the quality of the individual and the individual officer go from that to the ability to deploy in bigger units and fight a war, carry through a war-winning strategy or fight a, a war strategy. And we're in the middle of that transition from light infantry operations to heavy metal and other forms of, of warfare operation. And we're only halfway th through that transition now. I hope we make the transition before we need it. Well, we have another veteran of British operations in Afghanistan with us now, Johnny Ball, who served in the Intelligence Corps. Johnny, uh, welcome back to SITREP. Great to see you again. You are one of the driving forces behind a new Afghan veterans community. Can you just tell us a bit more about it and what it will do? Yeah, alongside my co-founder, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Mallett, it really came about during the period of Operation Pitting, where Matt and I were out socially in London uh, and we kind of looked at each other and inspired by the Falklands generation who were commemorating their 40th anniversary uh, and the South Atlantic Medal Association. And we turned to each other and said, 
where's ours um so that was really the start of the community and since then we've just been out and about talking to the 150,000 not all of them uh, but been been talking to the 150,000 large community asking them about their feelings about Afghanistan and as we approach the 10 year anniversary of the end of combat operations it mm. just felt right that this is the time uh, to provide a, a sense of unity uh, to provide a sense of empathy as well for those of us that serve that really understand what that period of our lives is like but most importantly looking forward a sense of progress um, of this largely working age population who are out there in the in society and some like Matt are still serving yeah a huge community you say 150,000 why, why is it so important to you it runs deep. Um, I think for many of us, Afghanistan was a formative experience. It's where most of my social friends from the armed forces community, there was a commonality around Afghanistan. Um, I think it was our generation's conflict. If we look back to previous generations, my uh, own inspiration for joining the army was my school caretaker, Mr. Webb, who was a Falklands War veteran. And those legends and previous generations, such as the Normandy Veterans Association, and who incidentally are actually the same size community 156,000 landed on the beaches of Normandy so we're comparative in terms of the number but I guess we've been inspired by those people we literally stand in their shadows of those giants um, that Afghanistan was a formative experience it's where many of us grew up um, it's where many of us lost friends um, so us really coming together as this shared experience community to be able to remember those that have fallen, uh, but also to bring us all together, bring people out of the shadows um, around this common shared experience as we look forward to the future um, and the rest of our lives. Yeah, and I, I guess for people still serving, like your co-founder, Matt, that commonality existed in the forces immediately after Afghanistan, but, but less so now? Yeah, well, Matt and I, it's, it's an obvious fact that I wasn't an officer. I left as a staff sergeant from the Army Reserves after nearly 22 years service. Matt's still serving, Lieutenant Colonel. And how can we be mates? But we are. We are mates outside of the military. And the when we get Afghan veterans together, you notice an instant bond, no matter what background, whether they're regular, reserve, whether they are RAF, Navy or um, or Army, or what herrick they're on, or if they're on op pitting or op toral, or the other names associated with Afghanistan over that 20 year period of our history. Uh, and I was actually with a Chelsea pensioner yesterday, Bill, who is 72. And guess what? He's an Afghan veteran. He's one of two mm. pensioners. So it's a multi-generational, multi-cap badge. But as soon as you get us together, there's a commonality. And that's really quite powerful. And what do you hope that men and women who served on Op Herrick will be able to get from this association, apart from that commonality that you mentioned? I'll be honest, uh, when Op Pitting happened, I did feel uh, a sense of shame. The, the manner in which we withdrew from Afghanistan was very difficult. I remember phoning into a radio station it, with my baby in my arms, um, really upset about the nature. I worked with, as an interpreter, as a Pashtu interpreter on the ground with school children, rebuilding schools. Uh, I found that their futures and that the hopes and fears that they've got dashed by that moment and the nature of our withdrawal, really difficult. But also I was immensely proud really proud of my colleagues and, and our actions on the ground in Afghanistan. So what I hope that this association or what this community is, we're known as the Afghan veterans community, because that's what the community told us in a set of focus groups over the summer they want us to be known as. I hope that we can regain the narrative of Afghanistan, the stuff out of our control, the nature of our withdrawal. That's now history. It's a sad, tragic mm. history. But what can we do in the future? We can actually regain the narrative around the sense of pride and every single veteran I spoke have spoken to so far, which is many online and in person, have spoken about the proud moments. So that's what I hope to achieve to bring us all together, pull people out of the shadows and connect this community. So how much has Op Herrick shaped who you are today? Massively. I think it's made me a far more empathetic person. I had the gift of learning a foreign language, so understanding foreign cultures, living in austere environments, um, appreciating what we have. So under that extreme um, operational environment of having nothing and meeting civilians that have nothing too. But I also saw the best of us. It gave me enormous hope of the men and women of the British Armed Forces, how absolutely brilliant they are 
under those pressures when you lose people when you have people injured or you become injured yourself and i've met many veterans who are injured in afghanistan so it gives me a sense of enormous hope and pride for the future and i think that's what afghanistan has given me it's left um indelible indelible ink mark on my mindset and my soul and my heart and even though it's not all of me it's a large part of me of being a very proud veteran of afghanistan and for those who served on op herrick how do they find out more about becoming part of this community well, naturally, we're available on all social media, whether it be Instagram, LinkedIn and Facebook. We're a nascent community. I would say to the community and also those that weren't Afghan veterans, come and like our page. See what we're up to. We're doing things in a different way. And the way that the community can help co-create this, be part of this, is by completing the Afghanistan Veterans Survey. And you'll see the link on our social media. We believe this is the largest survey ever undertaken in this country, specifically of Afghan veterans. Uh, we carried out a series of focus groups over the summer and every veteran was compensated financially because that's a new way of doing things. It's important that we value our people and their opinions. And now we're doing this quantitative research. So have your say, help us build this. Your views really do matter. So find us on social media and reach out to myself or Matt online individually. And what do you need to type in exactly to find you? At UK Afghan Veterans. Simple as that. Thank you so much, Johnny Ball. Great to speak. Yeah, thanks. Great to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, from the outside, it can be easy to misunderstand specific veterans, communities or associations and their importance, can't it? Yes. I mean, sometimes it looks like a a jolly amongst people who just want to relive the past. And it's not that at all. As Johnny said, it's not just that they have a shared experience. Of course, they all have that. It's the sort of shared experience of anybody who goes on trips and, and does things together. But in the case of battle or, or warfare or operations, it's something else. It's an emotional stretch. Everybody who goes to war is emotionally stretched. And what unites these people is that experience of the emotional stretch. So, of course, they have things that only they can understand with each other. They can't share it with the rest of us, both with pride, but also with fear and sometimes with shame. Lots of things happen on operations that people in subsequent uh, times are a bit ashamed about. And they can talk to each other about it because they all know what that emotional stretch felt like. And for those of us outside, you can see it. Um, But you can't be part of it. Only they can be part of it. And Mike, a final thought then. Ten years on, Afghanistan still shapes our forces. It's shaped the individuals who served. And as a country and society, has it shaped us all a bit? Yes, it has. uh, Because our our force has been on constant operations. We've seen them all the time. We honoured them. Some some of those who were killed and uh, were remember the Wooten Bassett phenomenon when people were brought back into RF Lynham and Wooten Bassett turned out uh, in these very moving um, but slightly ambiguous sort of ceremonies. I mean, the military weren't in entirely happy about that. They didn't want to um, deny it because people did it sincerely, but equally it made the military look like victims of government policy, not instruments of government policy. And so, yes, it shaped us all in lots of ways. And it reminds us and has reminded us that our military in Britain is always with us. It's always serving us. We always need it. And for that reason, almost unique in, in Western societies, the military in Britain is still very, very popular. And so, you know, that's not a good Mm. reason for fighting in Afghanistan just to make the military popular. But one of the effects of that has been to keep the military in the forefront of our national consciousness. Mike, thank you so much. And my thanks to all of our guests. That is all for now. Professor Michael Clark and I will be back with another SITREP next Thursday. In the meantime, you can stay up to date with all the latest defence news, including coverage of events marking 10 years since the end of combat operations in Afghanistan on our website, forcesnews.com. Bye-bye for now.